Привет, Анастасия. I don't speak Russian. I have to listen to a lot of Russian, though. Mm. Yeah, How it's it, well. Uh, the reason is is that uh, a lot of the leaders in this field um, are actually Russian speaking. Mm. So um, you wouldn't think it uh, in recent years, but for obvious reasons, uh, that they're not able to travel, uh, which is sad. I called it out at a recent conference in Strasbourg last year. Um, I, I said. Uh, you know, it's a shame that the Russian colleagues can't come here because they have so much to offer. And, uh, yeah. Is this the Dubna Institute? Uh, well, it, Dubna is where a lot of classic um, work in this field has gone on since the 60s. Um, it wasn't called low energy nuclear reactions as uh, it's been more recently named, or, although uh, everyone's trying to give it a new name, including us recently. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, several of the people that I have interacted with over the last, mm, let's say, <clears throat> 10 years or so, more than 10 years, uh, they have had relationships with that research city. Uh, there were several research cities, as you're probably aware, built during the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, I think there's another one in Prokvinov, uh, which had this huge 70 giga electron volt accelerator. And they were accelerating these protons into an aluminium target. And then through uh, something like 57 meters or something of, of iron and, and a, a big magnet and, and then through a spark chamber and then into seven cubic meters of um, fluorocarbon or something like that under up to 20 atmospheres of pressure. And they detected uh, something like 2,000 neutrinos uh, skewed towards the neutrinos, not anti-neutrinos. Um, so this was a very famous experiment. And, uh, you know, some people think neutrinos don't exist. And it's just absurd when you actually see a picture of what they can do. And it's the only thing that could get through to do that. Um, mm. So, yeah, yeah. Were the, were the Russians not as allergic to the, the term cold fusion throughout this time period? Well, why, why, there's a lot of work going on in that space. That well, I, I don't know whether they called it cold fusion. As far as I understand it, there's a, there's a very famous um, Soviet era scientist. Uh, he's actually a Ukrainian, Stanislav Adamenko. And he's done some of the most in incredible work in this field. Uh, the, the myth goes that he learned the Soviet method of nuclear synthesis in the 1950s. Uh, and it wasn't until 1999 that he managed to get a, a couple of uh, oligarchs together that ran the Privat Bank to fund him uh, the access to the old Soviet isotopic factory outside Kiev in the Ukraine. And uh, he ran probably the greatest systematic study of uh, nuclear synthesis ever conducted. And that was from 2000 to 2006. And... Uh, yeah, they basically shot 300 joules up to 300 joules through a dielectric barrier discharge uh, into metal targets. And it didn't matter which metal in the periodic table they used, they produced every other element in the periodic table 20,000 times in a row. And yeah. yes, and he has a patent in 2003, awarded patent, and then uh, he produced a... Um, a uh, book in 2006 and 2007 called Controlled Nuclear Synthesis. And the reason he produced this book was he was told flat out that he would never get the kind of work that he wanted to produce uh, uh, in form of papers published in any Western peer-reviewed journal. So they just decided to put it into this book, and it's about 754 pages long. And uh, essentially, this he basically challenged the world to come and see the results. They had all of the samples with all of the elements synthesized. So they'd take something like this little pin of pure copper, you know, five, six, nines of copper with a copper disc. And then they would have this plasma uh, bridge thing, 300 joules in there, an inductive discharge through a dielectric barrier made of alumina, and then goes in and, and, and pinches into the top of this electrode and the electrode explodes and uh, it produces all of these elements. Uh, and it's far, far higher 
uh, electron compression than anything that has been done with like petawatt lasers or these kind of things. According to the calculations, they say the energy releases about a thousand times over the energy that's put in, in t if you add up all the particle emissions, the transmutations that have occurred and so forth. And yeah, they created elements uh, not present in our near universe. This is into thousands of AMU. And uh, basically, it, there was four million dollars, I think, put up in 2015. That whole lab, which is uh, many tens of square meters, uh, many hundreds of square foot, I would imagine, in, in your neck of the woods, um, was lifted up from Ukraine, taken to Illinois. I think George Miley was in charge. Um, uh, they verified it between 2015 and 2017. And uh, under the, it was originally called the Proton 21 Labs. They called it Proton Scientific. They even have a web, had a website at the time that's all been taken down since it was verified. As far as we know, it was transferred to Brookhaven National Laboratory as part of the nuclear fusion program and it's gone dark. But essentially, the question, can you synthesize elements? is completely resolved. Yes, you can. You do not need supernova. You just need judicious application of impulse uh, of electricity uh, into a target. And in my view, the or and or is resonance. Uh, resonance is another way to achieve it. But in the Soviet sphere, they call it cold transmutation of nuclei, CTN, and ball lightning. And that's what they've been calling it for the best part of 30 years of their conferences. Uh, they're mm completely open about the actual cause. Um, whereas uh, in the West, every time you mention ball lightning, people get jittery and, oh, that's something we can't explain that exists. Um, <laughs> and they get all upset. So, so let's take a step back. Because, yeah. So we uh, we just recorded a conversation with Lawrence Forsley. Mm. Uh, sorry, I love him. He's a great guy. <laughs> and he's, he's a lot of fun. He yeah. had a lot of historical perspectives. Mm -hmm. But obviously the way that he comes at the question of fusion is very... Mm, buttoned up and academic. His career is, is firmly within these very uh, conventional structures. And from what I've gathered uh, looking into your work, you have this kind of historical, alchemical, almost occult history of <laughs> fusion. So I wonder if we couldn't use the time that we have together to outline some of that before we get into the details of how it works. Well, it, it, honestly, it certainly didn't start out that way. It, it just okay, so you didn't come at it from a... From an no, 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 no. 